Book Four, Part Four of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book Four, Part Four. Number Seven. After this, they marched into the country of the Tauchians five stages, thirty parasangs, and provisions failed. For the Tauchians lived in strong places, into which they had carried up all their stores. Now when the army arrived before one of these strong places, a mere fortress, without city or houses, into which a motley crowd of men and women and numerous flocks and herds were gathered, Carisophus attacked at once. When the first regiment fell back tired, a second advanced, and again a third, for it was impossible to surround the place in full force, as it was encircled by a river. Presently Xenophon came up with the rearguard, consisting of both light and heavy infantry, whereupon Carisophus halted him with the words, In the nick of time you have come, we must take this place, for the troops have no provisions unless we take it. Thereupon they consulted together, and to Xenophon's inquiry, what it was which hindered their simply walking in. Carisophus replied, There is just this one narrow approach which you see, but when we attempt to pass it by, they roll down volleys of stones from yonder overhanging crag, pointing up, and this is the state in which you find yourself, if you chance to be caught, and he pointed to some poor fellows, with their legs or ribs crushed to bits. But when they have expended their ammunition, said Xenophon. There is nothing else, is there, to hinder our passing? Certainly, except yonder handful of fellows, there is no one in front of us that we can see, and of them only two or three apparently are armed, and the distance to be traversed under fire is, as your eyes will tell you, about one hundred and fifty feet as near as can be, and of this space the first hundred is thickly covered with great pines at intervals. Under cover of these, what harm can come to our men from a pelt of stones, flying or rolling? So then, there is only fifty feet left to cross, during a lull of stones. Aye, said Carisophus, but with our first attempt to approach the bush, a galling fire of stones commences. The very thing we want, said the other, for they will use up their ammunition all the quicker. But let us select a point from which we shall have only a brief space to run across, if we can, and from which it will be easier to get back, if we wish. Thereupon Carisophus and Xenophon set out with Callimachus the Parhasian, the captain in command of the officers of the rear guard that day. The rest of the captains remained out of danger. That done, the next step was for a party of about seventy men to get away under the trees, not in a body, but one by one every one using his best precaution, and Agassus the Stymphalian, and Aristonymus the Methydrian, who were also officers of the rear-guard, were posted as supports outside the trees, for it was not possible for more than a single company to stand safely within the trees. Here Callimachus hit upon a pretty contrivance. He ran forward from the tree under which he was posted two or three paces, and as soon as the stones came whizzing, he retired easily, but at each excursion more than ten wagon-loads of rocks were expended. Agassius, seeing how Callimachus was amusing himself, and the whole army looking on as spectators, was seized with the fear that he might miss his chance of being first to run the gauntlet of the enemy's fire and get into the place. So, without a word of summons to his neighbour Aristonymus, or to Eurylochus of Lucia, both comrades of his, or to any one else, off he set on his own account, and passed the whole detachment. But Callimachus, seeing him tearing past, caught hold of his shield by the rim, and in the meantime Aristonymus the Methydrian ran past both, and after him Eurylochus of Lucia, for they were one and all aspirants to valour, and in that high pursuit each was the eager rival of the rest. So, in this strife of honour, the three of them took the fortress, and when they had once rushed in, not a stone more was hurled from overhead. And here 
a terrible spectacle displayed itself. The women first cast their infants down the cliff, and then they cast themselves after their fallen little ones, and the men likewise. In such a scene, Aeneas the Stymphalian, an officer, caught sight of a man with a fine dress about to throw himself over, and seized hold of him to stop him. But the other caught him to his arms, and both were gone in an instant, headlong down the crags, and were killed. Out of this place the merest handful of human beings were taken prisoners, but cattle and asses in abundance, and flocks of sheep. From this place they marched through the Chalibis seven stages, fifty parasangs. These were the bravest men whom they encountered on the whole march, coming cheerily to close quarters with them. They wore linen cuirasses reaching to the groin, and instead of the ordinary wings, or basques, a thickly plaited fringe of cords. They were also provided with greaves and helmets, and at the girdle a short sabre, about as long as the Laconian dagger, with which they cut the throats of those they mastered, and after severing the head from the trunk they would march along carrying it, singing and dancing, when they drew within their enemy's field of view. They carried also a spear fifteen cubits long, lanced at one end, this folk stayed in regular townships, and whenever the Hellens passed by, they invariably hung close on their heels fighting. They had dwelling places in their fortresses, and into them they had carried up their supplies, so that the Hellens could get nothing from this district, but supported themselves on the flocks and herds they had taken from the Tauchians. After this, the Hellens reached the river Harpasus, which was four hundred feet broad. Hence they marched through the Scythenians four stages, twenty parasangs, through a long level country to more villages, among which they halted three days, and got in supplies. Passing on from thence in four stages of twenty parasangs, they reached a large and prosperous well-populated city, which went by the name of Gymnias, from which the governor of the country sent them a guide to lead them through a district hostile to his own. This guide told them that within five days he would lead them to a place from which they would see the sea, and, he added, if I fail of my word, you are free to take my life. Accordingly, he put himself at their head, but he no sooner set foot in the country hostile to himself than he fell to encouraging them to burn and harry the land. Indeed, his exhortations were so earnest, it was plain that it was for this he had come and not out of the good will he bore the Hellens. On the fifth day they reached the mountain, the name of which was Theches. No sooner had the men in front ascended it, and caught sight of the sea, than a great cry arose, and Xenophon, in the rearguard, catching the sound of it, conjectured that another set of enemies must surely be attacking in front, for they were followed by the inhabitants of the country, which was all aflame. Indeed, the rear-guard had killed some, and captured others alive by laying an ambuscade. They had taken also about twenty wicker shields, covered with the raw hides of shaggy oxen. But as the shout became louder and nearer, and those who from time to time came up, began racing at the top of their speed towards the shouters, and the shouting continually recommenced, with yet greater volume as the numbers increased, Xenophon settled in his mind that something extraordinary must have happened, so he mounted his horse, and taking with him Lycius and the cavalry, he galloped to the rescue. Presently they could hear the soldiers shouting, and passing on the joyful word, THE SEA! THE SEA! Thereupon they began running, rear-guard and all, and the baggage animals and horses came galloping up, but when they had reached the summit, then indeed they fell to embracing one another, generals and officers and all, and the tears trickled down their cheeks, and on a sudden, someone, whoever it was, having passed down the order, the soldiers began bringing stones and erecting a great cairn, whereon they dedicated a host of untanned skins, and staves, and captured wicker shields, and with his own hand the guide hacked the shields to pieces, inviting the rest to follow his example. After this, the Hellens dismissed the guide, with a present raised from the common store, to wit, 
a horse, a silver bowl, a Persian dress, and ten derricks, but what he most begged to have were their rings, and of these he got several from the soldiers. So, after pointing out to them a village where they would find quarters, and the road by which they would proceed towards the land of the Macronis, as evening fell, he turned his back upon them in the night, and was gone. Number 8. From this point the Hellens marched through the country of the Macronis three stages, ten parasangs, and on the first day they reached the river, which formed the boundary between the land of the Macronis and the land of the Scythenians. Above them, on their right, they had a country of the sternest and ruggedest character, and on their left another river, into which the frontier river discharges itself, and which they must cross. This was thickly fringed with trees, which, though not of any great bulk, were closely packed. As soon as they came up to them, the Hellens proceeded to cut them down in their haste to get out of the place as soon as possible. But the Macronis, armed with wicker shields and lances and hair tunics, were already drawn up to receive them opposite the crossing. They were cheering one another on, and kept up a steady pelt of stones into the river, though they failed to reach the other side, or do any harm. At this juncture, one of the light infantry came up to Xenophon. He had been, he said, a slave at Athens, and he wished to tell him that he recognised the speech of these people. I think, said he, that this must be my native country, and if there is no objection, I will have a talk with them. No objection at all, replied Xenophon. Pray talk to them, and ask them first who they are. In answer to this question, they said, they were Macronies. Well then, said he, ask them why they are drawn up in battle and want to fight with us. They answered, because you are invading our country. The generals bade him say, if so, it is not with intention certainly of doing it or you any harm, but we have been at war with the king, and are now returning to Hellas, and all we want is to reach the sea. The others asked, were they willing to give them pledges to that effect? They replied, yes, they were ready to give and receive pledges to that effect. Then the Macronies gave a barbaric glance to the Hellens, and the Hellens a Hellenic glance to them. For these, they said, would serve as pledges, and both sides called upon the gods to witness. After the pledges were exchanged, the Macronies fell to vigorously hewing down trees, and constructing a road to help them across, mingling freely with the Hellens, and fraternizing in their midst, and they afforded them as good a market as they could, and for three days conducted them on their march, until they had brought them safely to the confines of the Colchians. At this point they were confronted by a great mountain chain, which however was accessible, and on it the Colchians were drawn up for battle. In the first instance, the Hellens drew up opposite in line of battle, as though they were minded to assault the hill in that order. But afterwards, the generals determined to hold a council of war, and consider how to make the fairest fight. Accordingly, Xenophon said, I am not for advancing in line, but advised to form companies by columns. To begin with, the line, he urged, would be scattered and thrown into disorder at once, for we shall find the mountain full of inequalities. It will be pathless here and easy to traverse there. The mere fact of first having formed in line and then seeing the line thrown into disorder must exercise a disheartening effect. Again, if we advance several deep, the enemy will none the less overlap us and turn their superfluous numbers to account as best they like while, if we march in shallow order, we may fully expect our line to be cut through and through by the thick rain of missiles and rush of men, and if this happen anywhere along the line, the whole line will equally suffer. No. My notion is to form columns by companies, covering ground sufficient with spaces between the companies to allow the last companies of each flank to be outside the enemy's flanks. Thus we shall, with our extreme companies, be outside the enemy's line, and the best men at the head of their columns will lead the attack, and every company will pick its way where the ground is easy. 
Also, it will be difficult for the enemy to force his way into the intervening spaces, when there are companies on both sides, nor will it be easy for him to cut in twain any individual company marching in column. If, too, any particular company should be pressed, the neighbouring company will come to the rescue, or if at any point any single company succeed in reaching the height, from that moment not one man of the enemy will stand his ground. This proposal was carried, and they formed into columns by companies. Then Xenophon, returning from the right wing to the left, addressed the soldiers. Men, he said, these men whom you see in front of you are the sole obstacles still interposed between us and the haven of our hopes so long deferred. We will swallow them up whole, without cooking, if we can. The several divisions fell into position, the companies were formed into columns, and the result was a total of something like eighty companies of heavy infantry, each company consisting on an average of a hundred men. The light infantry and bowmen were arranged in three divisions, two outside to support the left and the right respectively, and the third in the centre, each division consisting of about six hundred men. Before starting, the generals passed the order to offer prayer, and with the prayer and battle hymn rising from their lips, they commenced their advance. Carisphus and Xenophon, and the light infantry with them, advanced outside the enemy's line to right and left, and the enemy, seeing their advance, made an effort to keep parallel and confront them, but in order to do so, as he extended partly to right and partly to left, he was pulled to pieces, and there was a large space or hollow left in the centre of his line. Seeing them separate thus, the light infantry attached to the Arcadian battalion, under command of Aeschines, an Arcananian, mistook the movement for flight, and with a loud shout rushed on, and these were the first to scale the mountain summit, but they were closely followed up by the Arcadian heavy infantry, under command of Cleanor of Orchaminus. When they began running in that way, the enemy stood their ground no longer, but betook themselves to flight, one in one direction, one in another, and the Hellens scaled the hill and found quarters in numerous villages which contained supplies in abundance. Here, generally speaking, there was nothing to excite their wonderment, but the numbers of beehives were indeed astonishing, and so were certain properties of the honey. The effect upon the soldiers who tasted the combs was that they all went for the nonce quite off their heads, and suffered from vomiting and diarrhoea, with a total inability to stand steady on their legs. A small dose produced a condition not unlike violent drunkenness, a large one, an attack very like a fit of madness, and some dropped down, apparently at death's door. So they lay, hundreds of them, as if there had been a great defeat, a prey to the cruelest despondency. But the next day none had died, and almost at the same hour of the day at which they had eaten, they recovered their senses, and on the third or fourth day got on their legs again like convalescents after a severe course of medical treatment. From this place they marched on two stages, seven parasangs, and reached the sea at Trapezus, a populous Hellenic city on the Euxine Sea, a colony of the Sinopians, in the territory of the Colchians. Here they halted about thirty days in the villages of the Colchians, which they used as a base of operations to ravage the whole territory of Colchis. The men of Trapezus supplied the army with a market, entertained them, and gave them, as gifts of hospitality, oxen, and wheat, and wine. Further, they negotiated with them in behalf of their neighbours the Colchians, who dwelt in the plain for the most part, and from this folk also came gifts of hospitality in the shape of cattle. And now the Hellens made preparation for the sacrifice which they had vowed, and a sufficient number of cattle came in for them to offer thank-offerings for safe guidance to Zeus the Saviour, and to Heracles, and to the other gods, according to their vows." They instituted also a gymnastic contest on the mountainside, just where they were quartered, and chose Dracontius, a Spartan, who had been banished from home when a lad, having unintentionally slain another boy with a blow of his dagger, to superintend the course, 
and be president of the games. As soon as the sacrifices were over, they handed over the hides of the beasts to Dracontius, and bade him lead the way to his race-course. He merely waved his hand, and pointed to where they were standing, and said, There, this ridge is just the place for running, anywhere, everywhere. But how, he was asked, will they manage to wrestle on the hard, scrubby ground? Oh, worse knocks for those who are thrown, the president replied. There was a mile race for boys, the majority being captive lads, and for the long race more than sixty Cretans competed. There was wrestling, boxing, and the Pancratian. Altogether it was a beautiful spectacle. There was a large number of entries, and the emulation, with their companions, male and female, standing as spectators, was immense. There was horse racing also. The riders had to gallop down a steep incline to the sea, and then turn and come up again to the altar, and on the descent more than half rolled head over heels, and then back they came, toiling up the tremendous steep, scarcely out of a walking pace. Loud were the shouts, their laughter, and the cheers. End of Book Four